Hi. We continue our discussion of the law of momentum conservation. I remind you that we consider a system, arbitrary system of material points. So this is material point of mass m1, and this is material point of mass m2, and there may be other material points. And these masses, gen in general case, move in arbitrary way, and they interact between each other. And uh, the interaction between masses always obeys the Newton's third law, which results in cancellation of these forces if we sum up these vectors and try to find the resultant vector of all forces acting on these material points. So apart from the internal forces of interaction, there are external forces acting on the system of particles from, from the outside bodies. So the external force may be something like F1, vector F1, and that may be vector F2, arbitrary vectors arbitrary vectors of external forces, external interactions. And we have derived the following important result, that if all external forces, in our case equal to F1 plus F2, are equal to zero, then the total momentum of this system of bodies remains constant. So the uh, external, net external force may be zero if there are no external forces, or if the external forces acting on the system somehow cancel each other. There may be external forces, but they cancel each other. That's also uh, a frequent situation. Uh, so if the net or resultant vector of external forces, all external forces acting on the system of bodies is zero, then the momentum of the system of bodies remains constant. It means that uh, the initial momentum is the same as the final momentum, which can be measured over some period of time. And this vector of momentum was defined as m1 d1 plus m2 v2, etc. If there are many bodies, much more material points, then you have to take vector sum of all momenta of all material particles. This law of momentum conservation allows one to solve a lot of problems where little is known about forces of interaction. For example, I will consider such a simple problem here. Uh, imagine a surface of the water, a lake, and there is a boat in the lake. On the surface of the lake, a boat is floating. And uh, a boy wants to jump off the boat. He wants to dive into the water, and he dives and his initial velocity, oh, let it be u, the velocity with which the boy pushes the himself from the boat is given. For example, let it be 3 meters per second. So the boy pushes himself from the boat with such a force, in such a way that his body moves relative to the boat with the, this velocity, 3 meters per second. Let the mass of the boy be 50 kilograms and the mass of the boat 
be 100 kilograms. In this problem, we may find the velocity of the buoy relative to the ground and the velocity of the boat relative to the ground. So this velocity is the velocity of the buoy diving into the water relative to the boat. But as he pushes himself from the boat, the boat is pushed and the boat starts floating, S it starts moving with some velocity, which we have to find. This is the velocity of the boat. And also the buoy moves with some velocity relative to the ground, relative to uh, the shores of this vehicle, the river banks, if this is in the river. So we have to find these two velocities knowing nothing about the force of interaction. How does he jump from the boat? What is the force? How does this force depend on time? We don't know. And he doesn't know. He who dives. He may jump from the boat one, once using certain power in his legs, and the second time he may use a different way of, of diving and different power. So, so we don't, he, even he who, who dives, he doesn't know what will be the uh, function of the force of interaction of his between his legs and the boat versus time. It's an, an unknown function, and we know nothing about this force. But we don't need it, actually. The law of conservation of momentum allows one to solve this problem without considering forces of interaction. That's the main advantage of this law. It allows one to solve problems and to find solution knowing nothing about the forces of interaction. So if the momentum of the system of bodies remains constant, then the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. The initial momentum total factor of initial momentum equals the final momentum. And what is the initial momentum if, the ini if initially the boat was at rest and the boy here was at rest? The initial momentum is zero because the velocities are zero. The velocity of the boat and the velocity of the boy at, at initially was zero. So the initial momentum and the final momentum of the system remains zero. Why is momentum conserved here? Because there are no external forces acting on the boat. Is that absolutely correct? No. There are some forces. Force of gravity acting on the boat, directed vertically downward, and the force of buoyancy, which is the reaction of the water, is directed upward. And these two forces cancel each other. They cancel each other. Also, force of gravity is acting on the boy who jumps from here. And due to this force of gravity, he will go down and he will dive into the water. But this force of gravity is not balanced. When, when the boy dives, he pushes himself horizontally. Nothing is balancing the, the gravity pull acting on the boy. So this force is not balanced. Can we use the law of conservation of momentum in this case if there is an external force? The answer is yes, we can use it because the time of interaction between the boy and the boat is very small. And during this time, small interval of time, the action of external force will, have, will be very, very small. It, it will be negligible. That's always the case. When the time of interaction is small, we may neglect the action of some other forces, especially forces which are perpendicular to the velocity and which, which do not change the velocity immediately in horizontal direction, especially these kind of forces, which, are, which is the force of gravity acting on the, on the buoy. Th this force is vertical, and the, boy, the buoy's m m velocity is horizontal. So the force of gravity acting during the short time of interaction between the boy and the boat cannot change the situation here. We may neglect it because the time of interaction is very small and because the direction of, of the external force is perpendicular to the velocity. So 
we may, in, in this case, we may use the law of conservation of momentum. So the final momentum will be zero. What is the final momentum? The mass of the buoy times velocity of the buoy relative to the ground plus the mass of the boat and velocity of the boat relative to the ground equals zero. We have to, we have to uh, take velocities in this equation in a certain reference frame. Velocities relative to certain, uh, certain body. It's convenient to, to use the iner inertial reference frame associated with the Earth, with the ground, to measure these velocities. But nothing is known about these velocities. We have to find these two unknown quantities in this problem. The only thing we know is the relative velocity of the buoy with respect to the boat. This is something different. If buoy's velocity is directed here, this is v. We understand that he is jumping in this direction. And the boat velocity is directed here. The boat will go in opposite direction then the relative velocity will be u equal v minus v large minus uh, v capital minus small v. Uh, minus in vector form in vector form. I am looking at these vectors and I can see that uh, I can see that these vectors are related um, are related so that the velocity of the boat, for example, the vector of this velocity, and all these are vectors, velocity of the boat is sure to be equal to the Uh, velocity of the boat is u. No, uh, something's wrong here. <coughs> velocity of the boat is u minus v. That is, that's correct, and that is incorrect. <coughs> that's when I when I uh, when I recall that this uh, when I recall that this quantity is these are vector quantities, then I have to, I have to uh, take into account the vector property, vector, vector character of these properties. And then, then the velocity v will be equal to uh, small. Even, even this is incorrect. That will be v minus minus u. That, that's that will be correct. Yes, that's correct. In order to write down the correct relationship between vectors, it's always useful to put these vectors in slightly different way. It's, it's useful to draw these vectors uh, like in some uh, triangle. So that will be the vector V capital V. That will be small v. And, and if vector U is this one, then it's obvious that capital V plus U equals small v from this vector triangle. Capital V plus small u will equal small v. That's correct. From the triangle, uh, from the triangle, that will be correct. And that equation coincides with what, what is written here. <coughs> Actually, only if you take the small u to another part of this equation, then you will obtain this equation. So <coughs> in our solution, we must find scalar quantities. We, we don't have to find vectors. The, the problem is about the scalar quantities of these velocities. And we know the vector equation, how to uh, go to scalar quantities if you know the vector relationship between the vector quantities. Uh, 
we must use we must choose a uh, axis some axis like x and we must choose uh, in this axis the positive direction so all vectors looking in positive direction will be pos will have positive quantity and all vectors having uh, opposite direction will have negative uh, quantity so in this way in this way we will obtain the following uh, first of all as far as this equation is concerned v the velocity of the boat will be directed to the positive uh, to the positive end of this axis will be directed to the right so v will be positive capital v u the velocity of the boy relative to the to the boat will be directed in op will have opposite direction and v this this quantity will have also a uh, negative direction because the velocity of the boy will be directed to the left so that is opposite to positive direction and that will be negative so from this vector equation we come to scalar equation by introducing here signs somewhere we we put positive sign plus and somewhere minus depending on what is the direction of this of of uh, corresponding vector that's the general procedure to obtain correct uh, that's the general procedure to obtain to obtain scalar uh, quantities scalar equations out of vector equations also here this is the this is the vector equation and in order to obtain scalar equation we must take into account the direction of these vectors so vector v capital is the vector of the boat velocity it's directed to the right so it will be positive m capital v and small v must be directed up in the opposite to the left so small v must be negative it will be minus mv equal to zero so we obtain out of two vector equations we obtain two scalar equations after projecting these vectors on the chosen axis in, in this case a horizontal axis so, so because he jumps in this direction he jumps here he wants to dive in the water he jumps here and so he pushes the boat to the right while he himself moves to the left and dives in the water so this is given in the problem that he dives in this direction this is the statement of the problem that's why we know and we have seen how how boys dive have you ever seen so when people dive they they go where they jump they go in this direction not in opposite direction so now we have to solve this two equations with uh, two unknown quantities unknown quantity is v capital and small v and u is uh, known it's given in the problem and all other quantities are known so we must find we must find this okay let's do it it's not a complicated problem so we know what is small v if expressed uh, using other quantities in this problem so we may substitute this minus v in another equation and instead of this minus v we might substitute these quantities and then we obtain the first term will not we obtain the following the first term will not change m capital v then plus m because minus v instead of minus v i will use this expression capital v minus u and all this equal to zero and then <coughs> 
from this equation we obtain capital M plus small m times capital V will equal small m u. And from this equation, we may find capital V, which is required in this problem, the velocity of the boat relative to the ground. Capital V will be the velocity u, small m, divided by capital M plus small m. And that will be what? U is given as 3 meters per second. M is 50 kilograms. Capital M is 100. So we have 150 kilograms in the uh, in denominator. So what's here? 5 divided by 15 is 1 third. So this is 1 meter per second. The boat will go, will move in this direction with a velocity of one meter per second, relative, relative to the ground. After the boy jumps from, after the boy jumps from the boat, so and the velocity of the boy, which is relative to the ground, which is small v, can be calculated from here, small v in scalar relationship will be what? Will be u minus v, u minus v. u is given as three meters per second and v one meter per second. So the velocity of the boy will be two meters per second relative to the ground, with respect to the ground. So after the boy has jumped from the boat, after he dived in the water, his velocity relative to the ground will be not three meters per second, but just two meters per second. Because three meters per second is his velocity relative to the boat, with respect to the boat. And the boat will be pushed away and it will move at the velocity V capital, which is one meter per second. That's a simple case when we can apply law of conservation of momentum. And we may obtain final velocities, I underline this fact, while we know nothing about forces. That's very important. It's very often the case when we know nothing about forces or very little about forces of interaction. And uh, in order to use the second Newton's law, we must know f a force of interaction in order to use the second Newton's law. But if we have no information about force, how can we solve problem? How can we arrive at a final result if we know nothing about forces and the second Newton's law involves a force of interaction and we don't know it? So we will be unable to use the second Newton's law. But there are other laws of physics, luckily, Luckily, we are lucky to have in other laws of physics to tackle such situations when we know nothing about forces. We, anyway, uh, are able to obtain important results, even if there is no information about forces. OK. So. <coughs> A definition. A definition. Uh, consider a system of particles, m1, m2, etc. Maybe m3. It may be hundreds and thousands and millions of particles. But I can I consider just two of them, meaning that there are there may be many many particles. So we consider a system of particles which may interact between each other. And we introduce such a vector. Vector r will be defined by definition. Vector r will be defined in this way. In order to 
define vector r, we have to consider some system of reference with the origin in point O. And in this reference system, the first particle will have radius vector r, small r1, and the second particle will have radius vector small r2, etc. Each particle will have its own vector, which starts in the arbitrarily chosen point, which is accepted to be the origin of the reference frame. And each vector ends in the particle, in the corresponding particle. So if we introduce such a reference frame and introduce such vectors looking at, the, at each particle, then by definition vector r, which is equal to m1 r1 plus m2 r2 plus probably other particles if, if they are here, divided by m1 plus m2 plus other terms, if there are many particles. Such a vector r is called the center of mass. Center of mass of the system of systems of particles, of the system of particles. The center of mass, by definition, is given by this formula. Why this formula is very useful, we will see. We will see it later. But the definition of the center of mass is given by this formula, by this formula. So uh, from this definition, it's easy to derive some properties of this, uh, of this vector. Suppose the origin of coordinates point O coincides with the end of vector R, wherever vector R may be. I know that vector R should be somewhere here. So it coincides that point O is, is chosen to be here. The beginning of vector R and the end of vector R will be at the same point. It means that vector R will be 0. If I choose such a particular uh, reference frame in which the origin of this reference frame coincides with the end of vector R, then vector R will be 0. In this case, all this expression will be 0, and I will have m1 r1 plus m2 r2, probably other terms, equal to 0. From here, it's obvious that r1 equals minus m2 divided by m1 r2. So in this particular case, vector r1, which starts from the origin, and the origin is here, and looks to the mass m1, so vector r1 will be this vector in this particular reference frame with the origin at point O, which coincides with the center of mass. Then vector r will look at, at mass m1 and vector r1, and vector r2 will look at, will start at the origin O and will look at mass m2, that will be vector r2. So we can see that if vector capital R is 0, then vector small r1 is equal to minus vector small r2 with some coefficient, with some numerical coefficient. And that, I that expression means that vector r1 and r2, these two vectors, are, uh, are aligned along the same line. They are parallel to each other and oppositely directed. Parallel and oppositely directed. Which it means that they are directed along the same line. And this line can, is connecting the two particles. So the two vectors, r1 and r2, will be 
uh, will have this property that the center of mass will belong to the line connecting the two particles. Center of mass will be somewhere here between the two particles. And if mass m1 is equal to mass m2, then this numerical coefficient will be equal to unity. And that, that will mean that the center of mass will be exactly at the middle between the two masses. And if mass m2 is larger, then r1 become larger. So if mass m2 is too heavy, then the center of mass will be closer to mass to the heavy mass and farther from the light mass. So all this is obvious from this all this is obvious from this uh, formula. And we obtained this formula when we assumed that the reference frame origin coincides with the center of mass. Then vector r is zero. But what if uh, what if the origin of the reference frame does not coincide with the center of mass? Then vector r capital will not be 0. It will look here. That will be vector r. But the center of mass position will remain the same. It does not depend on the choice of coordinate system, on the choice of uh, the reference frame. So for such uh, a system of two particles, the center of mass of this system belongs to the line connecting these two particles and is located somewhere between these two particles. <coughs> That's the center of mass of the system of two particles by definition. Suppose the particles move somehow, that is, their position changes in time. Each particle may, di may be displaced, and it moves with time arbitrarily. It means that vector r will also change in time. And in some short period of time, the change of vector r, the change of the center of mass, the center of mass will also move. If this particle moves, then the center of mass will also change its coordinates, it will move. So the displacement of the center of mass will be given by this formula. That will be m1, displacement of the first particle, plus m2, displacement of the second particle, etc., divided by m1 plus m2. So if each particle moves, then uh, during some time interval, the displacement of particle m1 will be something denoted here by delta r1. And this displacement of particle m2 will be delta r2. And so this formula will give you the displacement of the center of mass of the system. Why this formula? Because this is the consequence of the definition of the center of mass. This is the definition, and this is the consequence. Now, if we divide this formula by delta t, and if we recall that de delta r divided by delta t is, by definition, the velocity, the vector of velocity in this case, that will be the velocity of the center of mass. It's not centimeters. It's the center of mass. So I, I put points here in order to not to, ch not to take it for centimeters. So if I divide this equation by the time interval delta t, during which all the displacement, displacements took place here, then I will obtain that the velocity of the center of mass equals m1, the velocity of the first particle, because I have to divide this term by delta t. And here, I will have to divide the second term again by delta t. I will obtain m2, the velocity of particle 2, and divided by m1 plus m2. So that's the expression for the velocity of motion of the center of mass of the system of particles, in case these particles are not at rest but move somehow. By the way, if all the particles are at rest, 
then v1, the velocity of the first particle is zero, and the velocity of the second particle is zero, and then the center of mass velocity will also be zero. If, if they are at rest, then the velocity of the center of mass will be zero. And now, look at this formula, and what is in the no in nominator of this formula in the nominator? The total momentum, the total momentum of the system of particles. By definition, the total momentum is this vector, and it's found here in the nominator of this formula. So the velocity of the center of mass turns out to be the total momentum of the system of particles divided by the total mass of the system of particles, where this capital M is just the sum of all masses, M1 plus M2, plus probably other masses of other particles. So we have found something interesting we have found that the total momentum of the system of particles equals the total mass of the system of particles times the velocity of the center of mass. What is total momentum of the system of particles? It's given by this formula. <laughs> total momentum of the system of particles. What is the total mass of the system of particles? It's just the sum of all masses of all particles. What is the velocity of the center of mass? Is it the velocity of some particular particle? No, no. The center of mass may turn out to be somewhere in the vacuum between particles. So if these are planets, two planets, the center of mass of these planets is in between them. That is somewhere in vacuum. There is no particle in this point just empty space. So this is not the velocity of some material body. No material body moves at this velocity. This is just the velocity of some imaginary point in vacuum, in empty space. The velocity of some imaginary point whose coordinates are defined by this formula. The velocity of the center of mass of the system of particles. So that will be another definition, another interesting uh, formula, another consequence of the definition of the center of mass. We may use the center of mass velocity to measure and to calculate the momentum, total momentum of the system of particles. So far, we have considered the situation when the net external force acting on the system of particles is zero. In this case, the total momentum of the system of particles remains constant. But what if the, the net external force is not zero? What, what if the net external force is not zero? Then. then each particle will move not only due to internal forces of interaction, but also due to external forces if they are not zero. And so even if there were no internal interaction at all, the particles will move due to external forces, even if there are no internal interaction in the system of particles. The particles will move due to external forces. Okay, five minutes interval. <laughs>
Okay, we continue our discussion of a system of particles and uh, the physical quantities which describe the system of particles and its properties. There are many properties in the system of particles. For example, the total mass, which is simply the sum of all masses of all particles. Another interesting property is the center of mass of the system of particles. This is a point which does not coincide with any particular particle, any particular mass. It may be some found somewhere in vacuum, but this point, center of mass, moves if all particles move in such a way that the total mass of the system of particles times the velocity of the center of mass gives you the total momentum of the system of particles. Well, if there are some external forces acting on the system of particles, then each external force will cause the corresponding mass to accelerate. That is the acceleration of mass number one. I assume that there are no internal forces, only the external force. Internal forces, I don't consider them. I assume they are zero, for simplicity. Then we have already derived it from here that F1 delta T, some time interval, short time interval, will be will give you m1 delta v1. That is the impulse of the force, impulse exerted during some short time interval delta t. And that is the change in momentum of the particle. We obtained this formula last time. This is very simple. This is the consequence of the second Newton's law and the definition of, mom of acceleration, the definition of acceleration that Acceleration is the change in velocity divided by the corresponding time interval. That is the de definition of acceleration. And from here, we obtain the connection relationship between the impulse of a force and the change of particle momentum. So this is for the first particle. The same for the second particle. If the external force acting on the second particle is F2, then F2 times delta T will be the mass of the second particle, M2, delta V2, the change of velocity of the second particle. And so on, there may be other particles, particle number 3 and particle number 4, etc. There may be many such equations. I will add them together, all these equations. And I will obtain here F1 plus F2 plus probably other terms, other vectors, times delta t. And here I will have m1 delta v change in velocity of the first, of the first particle, plus the mass of the second particle, delta v2, the change in velocity of the second particle, which occurs during time interval delta t plus probably other terms here if we have more than two particles. And all this is certainly the total momentum or the change of total momentum of the change of total momentum of the system of particles. And all this here in this round bracket is the net external force, net external force acting on the system of particles. The sum of all external particles uh, the sum of vectors of external force applied to different particles. So we obtain this equation that's a net external force acting on the system of particles equals the change of momentum of the system of particles divided by delta t. We obtain this formula assuming that there are no internal forces because we didn't 
we didn't mention, we didn't write ex internal forces of internal interaction here. But if we take into account the internal forces, they will appear in this sum and they will cancel due to Newton's third law. All the internal forces here will cancel because each internal force acting on one particle will, will have a corresponding internal force acting on another particle and these two forces are equal in magnitude and oppositely directed, so the two vectors will cancel. They will give zero when you add them. So you may take into account both external forces and internal forces here. That will not change the result. The result will remain the same. Whether there are internal interactions or no internal interactions, the result will remain the same. If there are internal forces, internal due to internal interaction, then all these internal forces will cancel here in this, in this, uh, in this, uh, within this round brackets in this expression. Only external forces will remain here due to Newton's third law. So this equation has a general meaning. It's applicable in any case whether you have internal interactions or no internal interactions. Anyway, this equation will be true. And if we look here at this particular equation which we have already obtained, that is the relationship between the momentum of the mass, momentum of the system of particles and the velocity of the center of mass, then from here we easily obtain that the change in momentum which occurs in some time interval, change in momentum will be equal to m times change in the velocity of the center of mass. And using this expression for the change in momentum, here we will obtain that instead of delta p change in momentum, I will substitute this expression which is the total mass of the system, delta v, the change in velocity of the center of mass, divided by delta t. And by definition, delta v divided by delta t is acceleration. This is an acceleration by definition. So we obtain the same, we obtain uh, this result the net external force acting on the system of particles equals the total mass of the system of particles times acceleration of the center of mass of the system of particles. This equation looks very much similar to the second Newton's law. But actually, the meaning is different because this is the vector sum of all forces acting on different particles, not on a single particle, but on different particles. And this is the total mass of the system. And this is the acceleration of some imaginary point which, is, which may be located in vacuum. This is not the acceleration of a material point. This may be a point in vacuum, just the center of mass of the system of particles. So this equation has a different meaning. It's not exactly the second Newton's law, regardless of the fact that it looks like the second Newton's law. But the meaning is different. Meaning of each term here is different. In the second Newton's law, this should be the acceleration of the body of mass m and the force F is applied to this particular body. That is in the second Newton's law. You have some body, some force applied to it, and the mass, and it, its acceleration. But here, this force is not applied to this particular body. This force, this is the vector sum of forces applied to different points of particles. And this is not the acceleration of a particular body. This is the acceleration of some imaginary point in vacuum. And this equation was obtained for any system of material particles. Any, arbitrary. What does it mean? What is the arbitrary system of material particles? It means anything, any body, any 
It may be a system of planets. It may be a solar system. It may be a galaxy. It may be any solid body, like this table. This is also a system of particles. It may be a liquid, a water in the glass. It's also a system of particles. Each atom is a particle, which has its own mass. And so this arbitrary system of material particles may be a water in a vessel, a water. It may be a gas. It may be a gas, because in a gas, each molecule is a particle which has its own mass and its velocity. So what is an arbitrary system of material particles? It's anything. It may be a gas in a vessel. It may be water flowing in the river. It may be any solid body. It may be a solar system. It may be a galaxy. It may be anything. And we obtained an equation which defines the motion of this arbitrary system of material points. We have to take, in, in, in order to find the acceleration of the center of mass of the system, we have to calculate the total external force, all the external forces acting on different parts of this system, different parts of material system. And this is the total mass of uh, the system. That's it. <coughs> That's a very powerful result. This formula is, has its own name. This is a theorem on the motion of the center of mass of material of the system of material points. A theorem. Wh what we obtained, we proved a theorem on the motion of the, se of the center of mass. A theorem on the motion of the center of mass of the system of material particles. This is a very powerful theorem because it can be applied to any, to arbitrary system of particles. And the forces may be applied to different parts of this uh, system. <coughs> OK, enough of, s of the s theoretical considerations. Let's consider some problems. Let's consider some problems. First, a very important problem about the colliding particles. Let there be two particles of masses m1 and m2. And one particle moves here at the velocity of v1, and another particle moves here at the velocity of v2. If these two particles collide, anything may happen. They may stick together. For example, these two particles may stick together and form a compound particle, stick together and remain as a single body. Or they may collide and then move apart in different directions. Or the particles colliding may break and into, into several uh, fragments, into many fragments. Well, anything may happen. We will consider the situation when two particles collide and form a compound particle when they stick together and remain as a single body. When they collide, they interact. But we know nothing about forces of interaction. The forces may be arbitrary. And the forces will depend on many, uh, on many unknown factors, like what, what is the particle and which, which side of one particle touches the side of another particle? How do they collide? We know nothing about it. And we don't know the forces of interaction. But anyway, th we know that these forces will be the internal forces acting between two particles. And that's enough to solve the problem. Because if there are only internal forces in the system of two bodies, 
But then the law of conservation of momentum will hold. And there are only internal forces. We assume that no external bodies act on it. Or there may be an external in interaction, but the time of interaction of these two particles is very short. They collide and stop, and this interaction is, takes just portions of a second, small portion of a second. So the time of the, the duration of interaction is very short. And therefore, during the interaction, the internal forces will be much, much greater than the external forces, like the force of gravity. In this case, we may neglect the external forces because they are either absent or very small compared to the internal forces of interaction. Then we neglect the e e external forces and take into account only the internal interaction. And if there is only internal interaction, only internal forces, then the law of conservation of momentum holds. That is, the initial momentum must equal the final momentum. The initial momentum is m1 v1 plus m2 vector v2. And the final momentum will be total mass of compound particle m1 plus m2 and the velocity of compound particle v capital. So the compound particle after collision will move at some velocity v capital. And we have to find this is, this is just the law of conservation of momentum. That is the initial momentum of the system of particles, which consists of the momentum of the first particle plus the momentum of the second particle. So that is the total initial momentum before the interaction, before the collision. And we know that the momentum will not change. It will remain the same, because only internal forces are present here and should be taken into account. So the momentum before the collision should be equal to the momentum of the system of the same particles after the collision. And we know that after the collision, the particles stuck together. And as a single body of, ma of mass m1 plus m2, they will move at some velocity v capital. And this velocity v of the motion of compound particles can easily be, easily be found from this equation. That will be m1 v1 plus m2 v2 divided by the sum m1 plus m2. That's the velocity of compound particle after collision. If the particles stuck. Why are we assuming, assuming that the, after the collision, the velocity is becoming the same? The two particles? Because we assume that two particles stuck together. We assume and we consider this particular case. Certainly, you are right. Particles may collide and, and run in different directions. For example, this particle may rebound here, and this particle may go in this direction after collision. Sometimes it happens. But also, sometimes the particles stick together, and we consider only this situation. And for this particular situation, when the particles stick together, for this particular situation, we have found the velocity of the compound particle after the collision. Does this formula tell you something? Does it remind you anything? <laughs> this is the same formula which was written for the velocity of the center of mass of two particles. The same formula. So this is the same formula, which means that the velocity of the compound particle after collision and after they stuck together will coincide with the velocity of the center of mass of two particles. So this is exactly the velocity of the center of mass of two particles. That's another reason why the center of mass notion is so important. It appears in many problems. It turns out to be important in many situations. The center of mass. It turns out to be the velocity of the compound particle, which appears after the collision, if in result of collision the two particles stick together and 
remain together for, for a considerable period of time. Sometimes in nuclear physics, such a compound particle later will separate into several fragments, sometimes. But while the compound particle exists, its velocity will be defined by this formula, which coincides with the formula for the velocity of the center of mass of two interacting particles. So the center of mass is a very important, uh, very important uh, characteristic, very important concept which describes a system of particles. And we will now, we will solve one problem about the center of mass because it's important, because it turns out to be important in many particular cases and in many problems, we will consider a problem uh, which requires to find a center of mass of a com of a something unusual. So I if you have only two particles, you know that the center of mass is somewhere between these two particles. And if the masses are equal, then the center of mass is exactly at the center of this section, in the middle between the two particles. This is a very simple situation. Let's consider a more complicated case. For example, what if we have a circle, a solid circle, This is the center of circle, and this is the radius. Well, not a big vector, it's just a radius, just a quantity. And we cut out a hole in this circle so that what remaining, what remains here is such a body of a complicated shape. So this is a solid circle with a cutout hole in it. And the hole has its own radius. Well, if this R1, then this radius R2 equals R1 divided by 2. This small radius is just half of the large radius. So we cut out such a such a small circle from this larger circle. And uh, the question is, where is the center of mass of this, of this figure, of, diff 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 of such a complicated shape? Where is the center of mass? How to find the center of mass of this figure? So we have discovered, we have introduced the center of mass by this formula. This is the definition of the vector which defines the center of mass of the system of particles. This is the definition. And we discovered that center of mass plays important role in many, many phenomena. We found the center of mass in the theorem on the motion of the center of mass, where A is the acceleration of the center of mass. And we found that the center of mass is the velocity of the compound particle when the two particles collide. So the center of mass is important. How to find the center of mass of such figure? According to this formula, we have to consider small pieces, small pieces of matter. This is mass m1, and this is mass m2, etc., etc. Many, many masses. This is mass number k, and each mass, and there are many, many other masses, many mass points, and each mass has its own radius vector. And we have to calculate, we have to integrate all such all such terms over the whole area of this complicated form, complicated shape figure. This is according to this formula, but is there any other way, a more simple way to find the center of mass of this circle? Certainly, certainly there is a simple, there is a simple way to find the position of the center of mass of such a shape, <coughs> certainly. Imagine that we have cut out this circle and then we returned it back here. 
So we inserted the figure which, which was cut out, and so that we obtained again the solid circle of radius R1. Then the center of mass of this circle is obviously located in the center of the circle in this point O. Obviously. And the center of mass of small circle is obviously located in, in its center here at the distance R2 from this from point O. So we know the center of mass of compound body, which consists of the complicated shape body and the circle which we cut out here and then returned back to this place. So we know the center of mass of this circle, which is in point O, and we know the center of mass of the small circle, which is here at the center of this circle. And we guess that the center of mass of this complicated figure will be somewhere here at the distance x from the center. It must be on this line connecting the centers of these two circles due to considerations of symmetry. Due to symmetry, the, the mass above and the mass below is the same, and this figure is symmetric with, with respect to this axis. And so the center of mass uh, must somehow be located here at some distance along on this line at some distance x from uh, the center of the large circle. So this is the x is the unknown quantity and if we find this quantity we will we will exactly know where the center of mass is of this figure with the cutout circle of this complicated shape so x is the position of the center of mass which we must find and we know the center of mass of the solid circle and the center of mass of the small circuit, circle <coughs> so when the small circle was returned here, and we had this, the solid large circle, the center of mass was at point O. And if we, if we start, if we put the origin of coordinate system at this point, then if we put the origin here, then uh, the coordinates of this point will be zero. If the origin, if this is the origin of coordinates, then this point will have zero coordinates. And the center of mass of the large circle at point O will have zero coordinates. Vector R will be zero. So this point, uh, the distance of this point from itself is zero. So this uh, center of mass of the two, two figures, one is complicated figure, complicated shape figure, and another figure is this small circle. Uh, these two compound, uh, these uh, two bodies ensure that the center of mass is here. So this is this uh, vector r. I will put it in scalar form, uh, considering only the distances of the corresponding points along uh, this line, along this axis. That will be zero if the if we know that the center of mass of the large circle is in this point A, and if we put the origin, uh, coordinates origin, co origin of coordinate system here at the same point, then this point will have zero coordinates. And we know that the center of mass of the large circle is here. So R is zero for the large, uh, for the large circle. And according to this formula, it will be equal to the mass M1 of this, what remains of the large circle times the distance to its own center of mass x plus the mass m2 of the cutout figure of the small circle times the distance to its uh, 
center of mass R2 divided by the sum of two masses. Uh, suppose the original mass of this large circle, um, solid circle, was M, capital M. Then the mass M2 of this cutout figure, M2, will be four times less than capital M because the radius of this small circle is half the radius of the large circle, and therefore the area of the small circle will be just four times less than the area of the large circle. And if the area is four times less, then the mass of the small circle will be four times less than the mass of the large solid circle before we cut out the small circle from it. And therefore, the mass m1 will be equal to what remains uh, after we take off this small circle from the large circle. So it will be equal to capital M minus one-fourth of capital M. It will be 3M divided by 4. So we know the mass of the complicated shape figure, and we know the mass of the small circle, small solid circle. So if we know M1 and M2, we can substitute here, and we obtain 0 equal what? M1 is 3 capital M over 4 times x plus m2. m2 is just capital M divided by 4 from here times r2. And from, from this equation, we can find x. x turns out to be negative, but this is natural because this is uh, if positive direction is to the right, then any distance calculated to the left of the uh, origin will be negative. So x will be negative from here. It will be minus m divided by 4 and divided by 3m times 4. And r2, r2 is half of r1. This is just r1 divided by 2. That's it. We can cancel, obviously, and obtain that x equals r1 divided by 6. So this distance x is just one-sixth of the large radius r1. One-sixth part, r1 divided by 6. And that will give you the position of the center of mass of this figure of complicated shape when we cut off the uh, circular, a solid circle here and take it away. The remaining mass distribution is complicated, but the center of mass will be here at this point. Yes? Why do you assume uh, R3 here? Uh -huh. R is the radius vector which starts in the origin card of coordinates, in the origin of coordinates, in the origin, and looks into the center of mass. But if the origin coincides with the center of mass, then the vector r is 0. It starts in the same point where it ends. This is the case I have chosen to consider. This is very convenient. This is just for the sake of convenience. I, I have chosen this point. I know that this point is the center of mass of the large circle before we cut a small circle. The center of mass is here. And so in order to have a zero coordinates of this center of mass, I choose the origin of coordinate system here. Therefore, I, I obtain that r is 0. I could have chosen the coordinate origin to be here, for example, at this point, O prime. I could have chosen such a coordinate y x, y x. So if the origin was here, then vector r would start here and end here then that would be vector r. And it would not be 0. But it's not very convenient. Uh, the answer will be the same, finally. I will solve the problem, and I will obtain the same point for the center of mass of this complicated form shape, complicated shape figure. The same point will be found for the center of mass. But the calculations will be such somewhat more <laughs> difficult. Well, in order to ease 
my life in order to make the cal calculations simpler. I have chosen the coordinate origin in the same point where the center of mass of the large circle is, so that i will be zero. That's it. That's my choice. That's for the purpose of convenience. Nothing more. We always choose a coordinate system so that it would be convenient for us, so that the calculations in this chosen coordinate system will not complicate the, uh, the solution. We always choose the coordinate, coordinate system and the origin uh, at the point where it's convenient, for the sake of convenience. So r is equal to 0. This is not a law of physics. <laughs> This is not a law. This is our choice. This is the law of physics, which does not depend on our choice. We may, we may choose any coordinate system. In any coordinate system, it will be a law of physics. But here, r equals 0. This is not the law of physics. This is just our choice of the origin. Well, we will have four minutes to consider the last problem. I would like to consider problem number 82. Problem 82 of Buchovtsev. It says, a massive homogeneous cylinder that can revolve without friction around a horizontal axis is secured on a cart standing on a smooth level surface. So the picture will be this one. A heavy homogeneous, massive homogeneous cylinder, which can rotate about this axis, perpendicular to, to the blackboard. And it's fixed on a cart, which can move along the horizontal surface without friction. A massive cylinder, homogeneous cylinder, that can revolve about point A can easily revolve about this point without friction, is secured on the horizontal on the horizontal cart, standing on a smooth surface of the table and with where it can move without friction. A bullet flying horizontally at some velocity strikes the cylinder, so a bullet here strikes the cylinder, and the impact is absolutely inelastic. You know what is inelastic is when, when the two particles stick together or when they have the same velocity after the collision, when they don't go far away, far apart from each other. Totally inelastic. So the bullet strikes the surface of the cylinder and the this is an uh, inelastic interaction. <coughs> and then, after striking the cylinder, the bullet drops here on the cart and remains here. So it flies, it strikes the cylinder, and after inelastic collision, drops here. Does the speed of the cart that it acquires after the impact depend on the point where the bullet strikes the cylinder? So the bullet may strike the cylinder here and then fall down, or the bullet may strike the cylinder here and then it falls down, or the bullet may strike the cylinder exactly opposite the axis of rotation and then fall down on the cart. Well, anyway, the bullet has some momentum. And this is the closed system of bodies. So the momentum must be conserved according to conservation of momentum law. So the momentum of the bullet will somehow be imparted to the cart, especially because the bullet will fall down here and remain, remain on, on this cart. So this looks like a, this looks like a, a inelastic collision. But if the bullet strikes here, the cylinder will rotate in this direction. If the bullet strikes here, the cylinder will rotate in different direction. 
And if the bullet strikes here at the center, the cylinder will not rotate at all. Will it influence somehow the final velocity of the cut? Will the velocity v depend on where the bullet strikes? What's your opinion? Just one minute. We need one minute more. What's your opinion? Will this velocity v, final velocity of the cart, depend on where the bullet strikes? And depend on whether the cylinder rotates or not? If we look at it, if we don't, if we don't if we don't know that there is a cylinder inside, if there is a box covering the cylinder, and we don't see, we don't know there is a cylinder. We just see that the bullet strikes this uh, object and remains there. Then the initial momentum will, will be equal to the final momentum of this box, which is the total mass of the box plus mass of the bullet, which is inside, times the final velocity, and it must be equal to the initial momentum of the bullet, according to the law of conservation of momentum, right? And the only thing you have, so the velocity v will not depend on where the bullet strikes, on where the bullet hits the cylinder. It, it will not depend. It, there, there is no cylinder in this equation and no direction of rotation. So the only thing we have to understand, why does it not depend on the rotation of the cylinder? Do you know why, physically, how can you explain it? Because the momentum of the rotating cylinder is zero. Because if this part of the cylinder moves in this direction, then the opposite parts, which is symmetrical, will move in opposite direction. The velocities will be opposite, and the total momentum of these two parts will be zero. And so if we consider the cylinder as consisting of many such points along any radius, along any diameter, then we will understand that the rotating cylinder has zero momentum. It has no zero energy. It has some kinetic energy, but zero momentum. The rotating cylinder has zero momentum. And so the final velocity of the cut will not depend on, on the rotation of this cylinder will not depend on it. OK. Let's on this point finish our lecture. We have taken.